speaking with Roy Mosman. He's an Athens native. He was born here and lived here his whole life. He is retired now from his own business. It was the classic electrical contractors. There were commercial contractors in the area for buildings here. He also served in Vietnam in the Army. Mm -hmm. And we're going to let him tell us first about what unit you were with and what kind of service that you saw over there and when. Okay, I was with the 9th Inf Division, 4th Battalion, 47th Infantry, Charlie Company. Uh, we were 2nd Brigade, which was known as the Mobile River Marine Force. We were probably the first unit, or were the first unit to work with the Navy since the Civil War. It was a very unusual unit because Normally you would think the Marines would be working with the Navy, but uh, no, they picked the Army unit. And uh, what I understand, the Marines wouldn't do it because they said the Navy was going to be in charge and the Marines wouldn't have it. So the Army says, okay, you can be in charge. So we, we were selected to be the Mobile River Marine Force. And we have a picture here of you with the squad that you served mm -hmm. with. Um, and actually, what, there were three of you in your squad that were from, from Georgia. It just so happens that yeah. there was. Uh, um, upper left is you. That's me. You're and very young. This, uh, this guy was from Atlanta named Sankey Thomas. Uh, he was from Grantville, Georgia, and Bobby Freeman. Unfortunately, Bobby didn't make it back. Uh, yeah. He was killed in Vietnam. But, uh, and you served there from? I served from October of 67 to October of 1968. And you were very young? You I went over, I was 19 years old, turned 20, October 28, and served there. When I came home, I wasn't able to buy a beer because I wasn't old enough. So I had to wait for a while. <laughs> and what took you over there? What, what got you into the Army in the first place? Well, it was, of course, the Vietnam War was at its height at that time, uh, 67. I knew I was going to be drafted. I was going to night school at the University of Georgia, and that wasn't going to get me a deferment. So I talked to my friend, and we both were going to go. So we said, okay, let's go together. So let's go down and volunteer for the draft. And we went down to see Ms. Pope, uh, who ran the draft board here, and asked her when we were going. She looked on the thing and said, yep, you're going to be going in July. And we said, well, just take us now. This was probably around first no, part of April. So next thing you know, we were going in on May the 2nd. Uh, get to Atlanta, to the reception center there, or the induction center. They turned my buddy down and I went on. <laughs> he was turned down. Uh, he came back and went back again about two months later and they took him that time, but it was too late. I was going on by myself and he was behind me. So. Well, you were in a unit that we haven't talked about in these interviews yet, the Mobile Riverine Force, um, which was kind of unusual. We've got a picture of where you were stationed. You actually lived much of the time um, on, on a ship. That's correct. We, uh, the second we gave, like I said, was Mobile Riverine. We were on barrack ships, which were converted LSTs. These ships were stationed out in the river outside of Dongtown, which was in the southern part of South Vietnam, uh, in the Song Mito River. Uh, we, there were about five ships, had troops on all of them. There was a command ship, and then most of them were barrack ships, and they were supply ships. Uh, we would, they were basically our base camp. We would move down the rivers if we were going to be down in a certain area for so long. They would move the ships and everything down set them up, anchor them in the base, and then we would go out and pull our missions on these ATCs, or armored troop carriers. Here's we call them were, tango boats. Yeah, that are attached to the right. side of the picture right. that They would that come in seen. and tie to the pontoons. We would load on them early in the mornings. They'd take us down the small rivers and canals. Some of them you could reach out and touch the brush on each side of you, which was very dangerous. And we were ambushed constantly. Yeah. On those. Well, the next picture shows how, what you would do. You would go right. out in a little line. Uh, yeah, that was several, stay together. several units going out together. It was like a platoon per boat. It hold about 30 to 40 people, and believe me, it was packed when you had all your equipment on, and you would sit trying to get in there and get comfortable. But in the how morning. many of those boats, the, the small troop carriers, would go out? Uh, well, the one unit, they were probably about uh, 10 to 11 of them, just depending on how many soldiers were going, you know. And then did you go for day trips or extended trips? No, we jungle? would go for several days. They would drop us off. We would go out in the jungle and do our search and destroy missions or whatever type of mission it was. And we would stay out for three to four days. 
Sometimes we would come back, get back on the boats and come back to our base camp. Sometimes we would be picked up by a chopper or helicopters and flown back. Uh, we couldn't stay out in the delta very long because of the jungle rot or the foot, the trench foot. It was so wet down there. And you were, so, that was the Mekong Delta. That was you the were Mekong the Delta. Or or the kind everything of was wet. I mean, we had canals or wet rice paddies and everything, and we stayed wet constantly. We had some guys that got the uh, trench foot, and they were never went to the field again. It was a deep, deep down to the bone almost. Hmm. And uh, so they would bring us back and let us dry out for a day or sometimes two days and then send us back out. When you were in the jungle, what were you personally doing? Just looking for looking, most of the time you were carrying, contact. I was, we carrying guns carrying and, carrying guns and, and then trying to find trying to find the enemy or they were trying to find us. Well, usually they were set up waiting on us to come to them. They were smart enough not to come after mm -hmm. us. So. And you had quite a few firefights uh, and encounters, in, didn't you? I was in quite a few. Uh, when I first got there, it wasn't too bad until February of 68 when they had the Tet Offensive. And that uh, just touched everything off and it got to where every time we'd go out then it would uh, it would would make contact with the enemy. It must have been pretty pretty bad because you were wounded three times. And yes. it amazes me that they sent you back <laughs> after the first two. Well, so, you, you, hear, you always hear that if you got three pur purple hearts, you would get out of the field. But that wasn't necessarily true. That depended <laughs> on the unit. Uh, I got one in March. Well, I got hit in the right forearm with shrapnel. I got hit on August the 12th, the night of August 12th, by an artillery round. I got hit in the back with shrapnel. And then just only three days later, we were coming back from a mission on the Tango boats and got hit with a B-40 rocket, and that was a pretty bad one. He got seven of us. Uh, one guy was worse than me, he had his leg blown off. Uh, I was hitting both legs, both arms, mouth, and it took me out of the field for six weeks. So, and I came back, and they wanted to send me out, and I said, nope, not going to do it, and he took me to the first sergeant. You know, the sergeant major, and he looked at me and said, no, he's only got 30 days left, three Purple Hearts, don't send him out, so. We have a picture here of the actual boat that you were on mm -hmm. around the time that you were, had right. that third well, injury. Actually, one, one like I was on, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could describe for us well, what, what we see, can see here in this picture. Well, these are all uh, gun mounts. We had, uh, they had 30 caliber guns. They had uh, 40 millimeter cannons. They had machine guns all over them. We were down inside of the wells here. They would pull up to the, the, the side of the river and drop us out. On top, later in the mature over there, they were canvas tops, and then they started. They put the metal decking where they could land a helicopter on. They so could, that helicopter that we see hovering over would could actually come land. in and take the wounded out. They could yeah. land right there on this small little those, those helicopter pilots or something else. You know, most of us have only seen pictures like this in movies. I mean, yeah. this almost looks like something out of <laughs> Apocalypse Now or yeah, something. Exactly. But I mean, exactly. many of you live that yes, experience exactly. that, that we saw. Exactly. With the, so so um, most of <laughs> it's interesting that, that <laughs> that you said that um, when we talked before the interview that there were different uh, experiences there that, that have changed your life forever and one of them was that last wound. You, you mm -hmm. Most of the, your injuries had shrapnel and was taken mm -hmm. out then, but, but, but what about now? Have you still suffer from the wounds? Uh, I don't have any physical problems with the wounds. I'm sure my arm is weaker because it took out a lot of muscle up there, but I have as little as a few months ago, picked metal out of my leg, so it's still, it's, it's still coming amazing. out. It was a small that? piece, but every <laughs> once in a while a little piece would show up. And so I'm they sure didn't that, get it all. Well, the doctors were working it. I've, I've talked to a doctor that was there when I was there. He could have worked on me. I don't know. He said he may have, and uh, he said they were moving and working so fast that they didn't have time to be real particular, uh -huh. so, you know, they get what they could. Well, beyond the physical, um, obviously there are a lot of psychological, you know, um, ramifications yes. of the experience that, that you lived through. Maybe you could tell us how you think it's changed your life for the better and for the worse. Well, I think for the better, uh, personally, it gave me a lot of confidence. Uh, it let me know that I could do a lot of things that I never thought I could do before. And I could withstand a lot of things that I didn't think I could. I think it helped me in life uh, as I 
came out and went through business and worked with people. I always tried to do my best and work harder than uh, than most people. I feel like most people would. I always gave it everything I could, and I think that came from being in the military. The discipline and Dis sense of service. Right, exactly, and not you know, people tell you to do something, you did it. You didn't argue about it. You just went on and did what you're supposed to do. And I don't care what it was. I was going to clean a bathroom. I cleaned it the best. I mean, I, I scrubbed it, you know, from top to bottom, and I think that came from the military. Uh, On the flip side? The flip side, uh, I suffer from PTSD, uh, like most of us in Vietnam, and, I, and a lot from World War II that never recognized it or never wanted to admit it. But uh, I have problems, and I've had them ever since I've come home from Vietnam. And I went for years and didn't want to recognize that, but about. Uh, 10 to 12 years ago, I knew I had a problem, so I started working on it, started going to the VA, and now I'm, I go to group therapy at the local VA clinic here, and I'm on medications that help. And my VA has worked with PTSD, you know, didn't recognize it for a long time, uh, but now they know it's real, and these guys that are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan are suffering. And, uh, so you go to a support group, yeah, and are there, are there a lot of um, gentlemen from from Vietnam? Yes, certainly? most are Vietnam. There's some coming in now from Afghanistan and Iraq. They, they're just like we were. They're young, and they don't want to accept it or don't want to get involved in these groups. We have some World War II, you know, uh, but uh, mostly Vietnam. And right now, I think there's about four or five groups that meet out there every week. So I know there's two groups that meet on the day I go, and it's been great. I mean, it's good. If we don't do anything but just sit in there and talk to each other, and we may not, we don't talk about Vietnam or our problems all the time. We might talk about our gardens or dogs or cats or whatever. You know, it's just good to be around somebody with the same problems. Well, do you think that part of the reason there was so much PTSD that maybe wasn't discovered at first, and why now you know, you're coming forth and, and different people are getting help for it, was because of the nature of the war and 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 how the Vietnam vets were um, were greeted when they came back. They they weren't greeted in essence. They weren't. Yes, you know, they I, celebrated I, right. like the World War II. Yes, vets I do. I other. think you know the, the World War II people came home. They came home to a crowd that loved them and wanted them home and did everything they could for them. The Vietnam veteran kind of, well, also, go back just a minute, they came home as a group. We came home as individuals. Sometimes it was only you were by yourself. I happened to come home with two people from my unit, flew all the way to Atlanta with one, and then we separated. I've never seen him since. But we didn't come back as a unit and do anything in the States as a unit. We just came back, just filtered ourselves back in. And it was just so, everybody was so indifferent to us. I didn't have the problems that some people had. They talked about being spit on and mm -hmm. called baby kill. I didn't experience that, and I'm glad I didn't. I did come in late at night in, San, in um, Oakland, and that might have been one of the reasons, but I did not have those problems. I won't say I did. Nobody ever called me a baby killer. Nobody ever spit on me, but uh, it was just so indifferent. You know, people were indifferent to me, and I would, even after I got home, I see my friends, and it was like, well, "Hey, how you doing?" You know what? Didn't even, they I didn't, didn't even didn't, realize. They didn't, they didn't acknowledge, but no, then did that I, make you feel uncomfortable? Exactly. I knew what I had been through, and it was hard for me to to accept the fact that they just had a normal life and went right on with everything. I enrolled at the University of Georgia in night school, and I had problems over there because a lot of the students and a lot of the professors at the time were putting down the Vietnam War and talking about the soldiers over there, and I, was, I wouldn't even say that I was a, a Vietnam veteran. I didn't want people to know it, and I had to sit there and listen to them cut us down and say, telling things that I knew weren't true, so it, it, it hurt. You know? That's very difficult. It hurt. Well, well, what point did you feel like you could start talking about it and acknowledging it more in public? It started getting better, and I don't know the exact date, but they had a big welcome home parade for the Vietnam veteran in Chicago. And I think that was probably in the 80s. And that kind of opened everything up, and people started, all the people in Chicago had a you know, welcomed these guys and had the parades and was doing everything for them. And it kind of woke the whole country up a little bit and people started forgiving us then or, or accepting us. And I think that was the biggest thing I threw. 
you um, stay in touch with many of uh, the people that you serve with, don't yes, you? Yes, I then? do. Mm -hmm. yeah, tell us about that. Tell us about the organization uh, you're involved in. Okay. Uh, my main organization is the Mobile River Reinforce Association. I'm the vice president of it. Uh, you can find it online at MRFA.org. Okay. And uh, there's a lot of information on there, but uh, we have reunion. We have about 5,000 members. That's uh, a lot. We have reunions every other year. And I've met a, got some guys that I was in Vietnam with, but a lot of them were people that were in the units over there I didn't know in Vietnam, but I've met them and have been friends with them for 20 years now. And it's so good if you go to a reunion and you see a guy that was in, in your platoon, you know, and you see him for the first time in 40-something years now, it's great. And I've, I've made a lot of contacts with these guys through the association, so it, it's really been great. That bond has never really broken. No, never. Never and, will be. And and how important is it then to you in your life to, to, to have those connections and to be and talk to those young people? Very important. I love it. Uh, I, I can be relaxed around those people. We can talk. We can. My wife couldn't believe it when I, one of my buddies in Vietnam was with me. That I was 12 and 13. We had such a bad Wi-Fi. We were right there together. And the first time we got together, my wife just sat there and shook her head because he was telling stories and it was the exact same thing I had told him for several years, you know, and she couldn't believe it. She said, that sounds just like Roy talking, so yeah. it's great just to have somebody that was that had the experience the, with The you. same experiences and stuff. Yeah. Well, um, you've also begun talking about so much in the last few years. You've been the subject of some interviews for documentaries <laughs> and a book. Tell us about the book. Well, uh, there was a, a reverend, Reverend Jim Johnson in Vietnam. He worked with the third of the 60th which was part of the 9th Division, and uh, he has PTSD, and he's a smart man. He wrote a book, and then he decided to write another book, and his second book is called Combat Trauma, and it's about PTSD, and he got, uh, ended up 16 people that he knew that knew, you know, having problems with PTSD, and I'm one of them, so I'm in the book uh, Combat Trauma, and I tell a lot in there, a lot of things I've never told anybody but my wife. And so we're, that book's out, you can get it at Barnes and Noble, it's Combat Trauma, Jim Johnson, or it may be James Johnson, I don't, mind. <laughs> don't remember how he's got it now, but uh, yeah, ended up in that. Now my wife is being interviewed for a companion book to give the wife's side of the story, or the, companion, the spouse's side. And do you think that there's more acceptance overall now for the for the Vietnam veterans that we've seen these other type of non-traditional wars, say in Iraq and Afghanistan? Yes, I think it's been a lot more because of Iraq and Afghanistan. We believe they've come back to, you know, everybody welcomes them home, they respect them and all, and in turn it's people have given more respect to the Vietnam veteran, and I can tell that. Uh, Facebook, I can write a comment on there about Vietnam and Everybody responds favorably to that and thanks me and all that and it feels good. And that really note, does. thank you very much for your service thank and you. for doing this interview with oh, us. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you. I appreciate you having the interest in it.